Now let's head to the outdoors and uh, let's see what uh, nature is uh, offering us up at this time of the year or just let's get a little glimpse as to uh, what we can look out for, what we should be enjoying, what we can be appreciating that's uh, around us uh, every day and not just during this crisis. Uh, Angus Kennedy of Nature Northwest joins us on the line. Angus, good afternoon to you. Hiya, John. How are you? Not so bad. Now, we're going to chat about uh, a couple of birds, first of all, and the, the first one, the gold crest, is actually the, the smallest breeding bird in Ireland. It's our smallest Tiny. bird. It's, it's an amazing little thing. Um, if you have a 20-cent coin uh, anywhere around you or, or in your pocket, dig it out and pop it into your hand. This little bird weighs less than a 20-cent coin. Wow. Um, they're amazing. They're so small, they're hardly there at all. They're about the size of a golf ball. Uh, even smaller than the little wren. Um, but they're pretty common in Ireland. They're throughout uh, an awful lot of Ireland, and certainly throughout Donegal. They like conifer trees. So they like the tall evergreen trees um, because th- those evergreen leaves host all sorts of tiny little bugs, which, uh, which they like to, to, uh, to eat. Um, and amazingly, for such a small, tiny bird, our population is uh, bolstered in the wintertime by birds that come all the way from as far as Russia. And they migrate all the way down across Europe trying to escape the cold and looking for bugs. So and they're but at this tough... time of year, of course, they're, they're setting up for a family. They're a, t- they're a toughie then for their size. And they, they, they like being up high. I mean, for, for a bird that size and weight, they, they actually like being up high as well. Yeah, so it's not the kind of thing you'll see on your bird feeder or skulking around underneath the bushes or like the, the wren, one of the other very small birds, which is often very low and nests very low. These guys, you're right, they like to go. But I haven't said that. Uh, this time of year is a great time of year for looking for these kind of things because there's an awful lot of bugs waking up. Uh, the birds are really active. They're trying to eat as much as they can to get... Um, Uh, to build up their their, uh, protein stores, so they're going to be producing eggs soon, of course. Um, But the leaves aren't out in the trees, and that's the thing. April is a great month for this kind of thing. Some of the trees have woken up from their their winter slumber uh, and are starting to go into leaf. A lot of them are still firmly shut. Um, So only the other day, out of my office window here in the home, I saw uh, a little gold crest. And you you, you can often tell them, because they move, they seem to move at least faster than any other bird. They're constantly on the move. Never stop. And uh, it, uh, I suppose they, g- given their um, metabolism, they, they, they have to be on the go all the time. They, they have to be on the go. Winter is particularly tough for them, and they die in big numbers, as do a lot of the kind of smaller creatures like that, um, because the day is so short in the winter. They've only got a few hours, and they need to eat up to two times their body weight. I am the little gold crest. It's, it's amazing. They eat a, a huge amount every single day just to try and put on enough fat layers to shiver their way through the night. But this time of year, it's all about breeding season. I might play their song for you, actually. Yeah. Um, if you can hear it now, it's very high pitch. It's a very high frequency. Not everybody might be able to hear it. Um, and people liken it to a, a squeaky wheelbarrow. Hang on, we'll, we'll play it here now. Were you able to hear that I okay? Ju- just just about. Uh, this is, it <laughs> could be the high frequency in my hearing, you know. But um, So, yeah, a squeaky wheelbarrow would be a good description right enough. Yeah, and, and I was in a conversation with some people earlier on this morning. Um, there's a group of people with green schools that I work with, and we're looking at, uh, we're trying to learn or, or teach everybody a new bird song every week. It's great fun, and people are coming up with their own observations. Um, and, uh, and they were trying to figure out the best time of the day to listen to the birds. I like when I'm listening to birds, I've got to go out in the evening time to find myself a nice little spot under a tree somewhere, sit down somewhere comfy like that and wrap up and then stay still. And after about 10, 15 minutes, the birds have forgotten you're there um, and you'll often hear that little fellow. And the reason I like the evening time more than the morning is because there's not as many singing and they sing a bit more sporadically, but yeah. still most of them will announce their presence and um, so you can pick out their tunes. Whereas early in the morning at this time of year onwards, an awful lot of birds are singing all at once and it's hard to distinguish that really high-pitched little squeaky wheelbarrow song of the gold crest. The birds around our house seem to be more active in the morning than they are in the latter part of the day. Is that is that common? That is, yeah. Morning, morning and evening is when they are going to feed the most and the rest. Um, and this time of year, morning time is very active time. Uh, the dawn chorus will be, well, has already started really and will just increase and increase when they, they sing and announce their presence, um, which proclaims their territory really. It's how they mark out their territory to other, other rivals. Um, 
and they strengthen their, their breeding bonds. A lot of the, the birds do that. Most of our smaller garden birds do that. Um, and then once it's bright enough, they'll start foraging. So a lot of them are foraging and up and at it um, before, uh, before we're out of bed at all. The early bird gets the worm. Having said that, you'll still get a lot of activity later on in the day, um, but, uh, but it's easier to spot because it's not quite as frantic. Okay. Now, another very common bird and a very familiar bird because it would be, it would be down... Uh, you know, uh, down a bit lower than the, the gold crest and maybe not move quite as fast is the, the common blackbird. The blackbird is a wonderful bird and is one of my very favourite. Let me just play you this sound. I think this will be a very familiar sound. It's not their song, it's their alarm call. So I'll just play this for you, see if you can hear this. Could you yeah, hear that? Absolutely, yeah, loud and clear. Yeah. And, and so um, that's, that's, uh, that's um, a warning of danger. That's their, that's their alarm call. And the, at this time of year, when they're setting up their breeding territories, um, they'll be uh, in their little area. They'll often make those little sounds. But if there's anything, like, say, a sparrowhawk uh, coming in um, to try and hunt or, say, a magpie coming in looking for nests or a cat skulking down the bottom, even if you can't see those predators or if you can't see the danger, if you're sitting still in your garden and listening to that, you can often trace where it is because as the predator moves, as, say, the cat skulks, skulks along the hedge uh, in the field behind you or the garden behind you, you'll hear each territory starting to kick off and the one that's closest will make the biggest noise and the highest pitch and the most alarmed noise and the other ones will all follow up with a similar call um, but they'll be, they'll be chatting to each other and warning each other of the danger. It's a little kind of community danger call uh, and it's amazing stuff because you can quite literally trace all the different territories just by that one pack if you, if, or by that one little uh, sound if you listen for it. And end up being quite the chorus. Now, uh, it, one of the unique things about blackbirds is that the males and females aren't alike. They, they aren't alike. So the blackbird is stunningly, uh, stunning, beautiful black, a shiny black, and has this amazing um, golden ring around its eye, around its dark, dark, very large proportion for the size of its head, uh, around its eyeball, and the bright yellowy orange bill. And the brighter yellow, uh, yellow and orange it is, the healthier it is, the stronger it is, and the more attractive it is to its mate. Whereas the female is actually a very dark brown, and it's, it's slightly speckled on the, on the front. Nothing like as speckled as the song thrush or the missile thrush, but it has slightly slight speckles which helps with it um, camouflaging in the hedges and the rest of it. It, it they're very interesting because in the, in the winter time we get a lot of blackbirds that come and mar- uh, blackbirds are pouring through from all over the country from Scotland from northern England um, so the chances are the blackbirds that you see in your garden a lot of them are not the same there's different ones coming through every day and they tolerate each other quite well whereas at this time of year um, they tend to go back to wherever they bred last year and blackbirds can live for up to 20 odd years so they can live for a very long time um, and so they go back and they go back and find the same mate and go back to the same territory and they won't tolerate other birds as well they might oh. tolerate another mature male if it's coming into its territory for a bit of feeding as long as it leaves again quickly but the younger males when you hear a lot of squawking going on chances are that's one of the mature males has come back to your garden to breed it's probably been there for years and it's chasing off any, uh, any mm. pretenders that are trying to get their, get their territory and they're not as fussy as some other birds about their habitats. They can live in a variety of habitats. Is that right? Yeah, they can indeed. Yeah, the, um, so you will. Uh, I have uh, a couple of nests, actually blackbird nests, which my brother got for me from um, some of his bushes. Now my brother lives in Crumlin, uh, and a lot of the little gardens that they have there are um, uh, are covered in paving and all the rest of it. And when you look out of his spare bedroom, um, he has this little haven. He has bushes. He has black thorn and wind bushes from up around from our garden. He's got trees. He's got all sorts. Um, so it, it's created this crazy little habitat um, where blackbirds normally would like quite a big-ish territory. They are living right beside each other. So they'll go into the little bushes there. Uh, and then in the winter time, his bushes are quite thin. The, the nests tend to get blown out and get destroyed and the rest of it. Um, but uh, they'll, they'll go into hedgerows, they'll go into those urban settings in the middle of Crumlin, um, where it's all concrete, or they'll, um, they'll be nesting in the likes of Ards and Glen Bay and places like that too. Yeah. Yeah. They seem to have found their way in uh, urban environments, and you'll, also, you'll often hear them sitting up on, on aerials or uh, you know, chimney tops and, and, and singing away. Yeah, so, so much of our nature has adapted 
to our own way of living. Uh, for instance, they think um, blackbirds only started nesting in Britain, uh, in, sorry, in gardens in Britain, um, about 100 years ago. And that's probably the same for us, as we've been changing the way that we use the land, as we've been removing hedgerow, removing woodland and whatnot, removing their natural habitat. So, for instance, in Eastern Europe, uh, it's very rare to get them in gardens because they still have a lot of extensive woodlands. So the blackbird likes to, likes to hide out in the woodlands there, doesn't need to come into the gardens, whereas here it's managed to adapt itself to our own gardens. And thankfully, people have lots of bushes, lots of good hedges, especially in the likes of Donegal, so lots of places for the blackbird to go. And, and of course, they'll, um, they'll eat up various different bugs for you. They'll eat the berries in the, in the autumn time, but worms is their speciality. They love worms, and they're able to find the worms, amazingly. They find them by sight, but also by listening. And they've done a lot of studies on this recently. Um, they, they're able to, when you see the blackbird wandering across your lawn, you'll see its little cocked head. And for a long time, there was theories, is this, is this so its, its eye can hone in on, uh, on the little worm that's wriggling in the ground or disappearing down its burrow? Because most birds, they can't move their eyeballs like we can, so they need to cock their head one way or the other way um, to try and get their vision right. Or is this so that they can hear a little bit better? Their ear is hidden behind feathers. It's right behind their eye. Um, and a Canadian study reasonably recently um, figured out that, yes, they can hear because they played the sound of the worm, um, which is at a very low frequency, the sound of the worm burrowing through the ground. Now, you think of that. Mm -hmm. It's not something we'd be able to pick up at all. Um, but they played this sound. Um, which is at a much lower frequency, and they also played sounds like cars and people and uh, all the kind of urban sounds that we might have outside of our, our gardens and houses, which are at a higher frequency. And that didn't seem to bother the blackbirds. They were able to ignore all that white noise and still hear that really low frequency rumbling of the earthworm wriggling through the ground, which is quite amazing, really. Which meant food for them. Now, uh, Texas says, uh, could you ask Angus what his opinion is on installing man-made nest boxes for peregrines in tall buildings like cathedrals and so on? Uh, bringing the peregrine into towns and villages and killing our garden birds. Culling these should be done. Any bird lover doesn't want to see a bird being eaten alive by these predators in the back garden. I keep birds and I'm tortured by these predators. I protect them to the best of my ability. And, and it's something I'm often asked. The sparrow hawk, for instance, I'll, I'll come back to the peregrine in a second, but the sparrow hawk is our most common bird of prey. And it looks like a small sparrow hawk, or a, sorry, a small peregrine. It has those white and brown bars on the front and then a kind of brownish back. Um, and they're amazing hunters. But a lot of study that's been done has found that if you have a sparrow hawk that's picking off some of the birds at your bird feeder, it's actually doing you a favor. And more to the point, it's doing the birds a favor in the long term. Nine out of ten of its hunts aren't successful. So 90% of the time the bird gets away. Um, and the ones that it does pick off are the ones that are a little bit slower, uh, slower to react, aren't quite as good as hiding, aren't quite as good as reacting to everybody else's alarms because small birds have a specific alarm call for birds of prey. Um, so what they're doing is they're strengthening the gene pool. So the ones that then go and nest in your garden uh, and produce offspring are the mums and dads that have managed to evade a winter of being hunted by the sparrowhawk. And a similar kind of thing could be said for the peregrine. They're a little bit different. They'll go for much bigger birds. Um, so they have started to move into the cities on their own uh, because their habitats uh, are getting destroyed elsewhere. They're getting hunted by various people. Of course, it's highly illegal to do that. Um, but there was only in the last estimate a few hundred pairs, I think it was about four or 500 pairs of peregrines in the whole country, which is a terribly sad thing um, because they're the fastest um, bird, fastest creature on the planet. They're amazing things. They, go, they, they can dive or stoop faster than a Formula One racing car. Um, and they go for bigger birds like pigeons. That's what they particularly go for. And the likes of Dublin people are very happy to see them there because there's lots of pigeons and there's lots of gulls and they will take out some of the smaller gulls um, uh, when they get a chance and they nest high up in the uh, in the cathedrals and some of the tall buildings because that, that uh, we've kind of recreated their habitat which would be cliffs. They, they'd normally like tall cliffs and for instance they'll get some nesting in some of the cliffs near uh, near Glenvay and places like that you know. So put, putting up bird boxes for them I think is actually a great thing. The amount of, of birds that they'll take from your garden very little. The peregrines uh, peregrines won't really come into human contact or into your gardens as much at all um, whereas they you will get them in the cities taking out the pigeons and the, and the gulls. Okay. Someone asked about the yellow hammer. What happened to it? Colour hasn't seen one in ages. Yellow hammer is unfortunately, it's linked to um, 
Uh, well, there's lions in so many of our birds, and yellow hammers, which used to be a very common thing when I was small or in my uh, my parents' time, yellow hammer would have been a bird that everybody would have seen all over the countryside. Um, now, if you look up the yellow hammer on um, the birdatlas.org maps, birdatlas.org maps, um, and if you punch that into Google, and you, you'll find. Um, fairly comprehensive maps of where the Yellowhammer is. They still have them on the east coast and the, uh, around the south southeast of Ireland uh, where there's still a lot of arable crops. Yellowhammers, uh, a bit like some of the buntings, the corn bunting, for instance, they love, uh, they love the little seeds. Uh, and we've changed that way of farming. We've got rid of that way of, of growing so many arable crops. And one of the one things that have gone with them is the Yellowhammer, not completely disappeared, um, but the corn bunting, which is a kind of similar bird, uh, has gone and hasn't bred in Ireland for the last few years and we've managed to wipe that out altogether I, not we don't have to if we left a little bit of room if we encouraged if we helped our landowners to leave a little bit of room for these birds well then we w- they would come back um, but we need to help people to do that we need to set up our, our uh, support systems in a way that it's, it's practical for people to do that incentives right another caller has a blackbird with a white tail in his garden what could it be uh, well, you can sometimes, that can sometimes happen in the blackbirds, all right? You can sometimes get an unusual colouring in them. Sometimes little parts of them can be white, parts of the wings can be white. It's pretty unusual, but it's pretty cool to see. And one of the nice things about that is take a little note of it. Note it down in, in your diary. I, I know we're talking to a lot of people. There's a lot of people who started keeping diaries now over uh, uh, over our, our lockdown of different nice little things that they see. It, it helps kind of focus the mind and focus you on, on what's out and about and happening, the first swallow that might have arrived or whatever. Um, and if you take a note of that bird and when it comes, there's a good chance, if it's here now, there's a good chance it'll be back every spring. It mightn't necessarily successfully breathe, that's the only thing, uh, but I'd be very interested to find out if it does. And as you have pointed out in the past, a lot of birds are territorial, so the, the bird that you see today could be the same bird that you see tomorrow and so on. Yeah, from this time of year. So one of the reasons I want to talk about the blackbirds this week in particular was because up until now, blackbirds start singing in around about February time. And when they're singing, as opposed to just that little call, uh, they're marking out their territory. But the birds that sing in February and March are the young males, last year's males that are now trying to establish a breeding territory. And then the older, wiser males come back in around about end of March, early April time. And they look at these young pretenders and smile to themselves and they start singing and they sing a longer song. And the longer the song, the more embellishments to the song, the older the blackbird is and seemingly the more attractive it is to its mate. They try and keep the same mate year after year. Um, and they will, uh, so the song now gets much richer for the blackbird and that's it holding its territory. They might even have two nests, unusual in Donegal, but occasionally they can have two nests, quite common down, down south of the country uh, where the weather's a little bit warmer um, and they'll be here right up until uh, July or so and they'll be very busy trying to chase off those young pretenders trying to, to rob their territory. Someone else is chatting about larks and uh, hasn't seen them. How do we get them back? Larks are larks are uh, of open fields, arable lands, and they will be on the dunes as well. They come into the open fields and the arable lands in the winter time. I see them a lot around my area, around between Remelton, Letterkenny, and, and those kind of areas, in, in some of the fields, and uh, the stubble fields and whatnot. Um, but at this time of year now, they're already starting to sing in the bogs and and the sand dunes. And it's one of the things. Once this lockdown finishes, I'm looking forward to is going for nice uh, walks in the bogs because the last walk I had in the bog was a few weeks ago three, a little more, maybe four weeks ago, um, and there was meadow pipits singing, but I didn't hear any skylarks. And I know that the skylarks will start singing, or will have started singing already, actually. Uh, and they have the longest bird song out of any song, uh, out of any bird in the world. They can sing for up to four minutes. That's they go why high, so high up famous. in the sky and sing and sing. It's amazing things, yeah. Brilliant. Someone says, how can I get rid of starlings from my shed? See, I think we touched well, on this last week as well. We we did, yeah. And I have starlings that are, um, uh, you need to get some sparrows. <laughs> and that sounds like a smart answer. I've got starlings and sparrows trying to nest in my house. And there's been a very interesting battle um, between the starlings and the sparrows. And starlings are much bigger, but there's a lot of the sparrows. And the sparrows have been having a face-off. And they have actually managed to chase out the starlings from underneath the roof. Uh, and they've taken over the space themselves, um, which means they're tapping uh, at half five, six in the morning. It's not as loud uh, as the starlings tapping. Uh, and the starlings have gone into some local bushes, which they, they'll quite often do. Um, they're protected, unfortunately, once they're in there, um, 
uh, you're not allowed to remove them. They're protected by the law. And remember that starling numbers, uh, along with sparrows and so many of our birds, like the yellow hammers we're just talking about, have really gone down. Uh, and an awful lot of their habitats are disappearing. It's one of the reasons that they're coming into um, uh, to these kind of human places. Um, so if you can tolerate them for the few weeks, yes, they'll make a bit of a mess. Try and put an old sheet or some old cardboard or something just directly underneath their nest. Um, and then next year you can put up some starling boxes for them and you can try and put up some nest boxes and encourage them or, or, or later on in the year. A texture says, I've noticed a flock of red wing thrushes uh, around uh, last yeah. week getting berries. That's great. And uh, someone else says, uh, why are they still cutting trees up in the forest? Uh, the birds not build in pine trees. Yeah, well, the, the, the red wings first, It's um, I saw somebody posted just this morning. There's a great website, by the way, called irishbirding.com. It's worth having a little look at. And various uh, people put in um, birds, usually typically unusual birds, not the terribly common birds, but they'll put in the first bird, the first swallow that arrives. So the swallows have been pouring into the country just over the last few days with these new southerly winds. Um, that we're having, which is going to give us warmer weather for the next few days. Actually, we'll hopefully get some lovely weather. Um, and with them, we'll get swallows. We'll, uh, we'll, the sand martins are already coming in and some of the other uh, warblers, which we'll talk about over the next few weeks, hopefully. Um, but the red wings are starting to move north. So somebody was reporting just this morning that red wings were spotted at Fanage, right up the top of Fanage. Um, they eat up the berries, they gobble up the berries, but they'll be heading back north very soon, um, all the way up as far as, as Scandinavia. Somebody else was on this morning talking about swans, um, and they heard some swans, they think it was some swans, last night over their house, uh, again on the Fanage Peninsula, and they're also starting to move north. So is this great movement north of red wings and swans and geese and all the rest of it are heading north. Also, the swallows and the other birds are coming north from Africa, from Europe, to join us, um, which, is a, which is a great thing. Uh, a texter says, I find if I throw food scraps out in a field now, it's seagulls instead of crows that take them. Where have all the crows gone? I thought there was plenty of crows around. There's still, there's still plenty of crows. Um, the gulls and the crows, those two families are the two by far the cleverest and most adaptable families of birds um, that we have here at least. Um, and you can see that by the way the gulls, uh, herring gulls in particular, the, the big one with the big yellow beak with the little red spot on it, uh, has taken over an awful lot of the nesting sites in Dublin. Um, when I grew up in Dublin, I'd go into the likes of Phoenix Park um, and the, the uh, ponds in the middle there would be full of uh, ducks and coot and birds like that. Now they're mostly full of gulls, but a large part of that reason is because the, the habitat has been compromised for the gulls as well. So they have managed to find uh, a place where there's lots of, um, uh, lots of food. It, it, it's most likely there's been some very damp weather over the last few days. We've had, uh, we've had all sorts of little bits of rain coming in. I've had a lot of gulls flying over my house too. Suddenly they'll come in little flocks. When the weather gets a little bit drier, they tend to push back out to the coast again. Um, so it's probably just weather connected, and they've, they've probably been the ones to spot it before the crows. But leave out your food, and the crows will, will come too. Someone has a question about 5G. It's here, and they're wondering, you know, can it affect birds? Yeah, and it, this is something that um, has been asked uh, a good bit recently, and there was a mast going up reasonably close to me, and it's something I was uh, I was looking at. I have I contacted Birdwatch Ireland, I contacted Bat Conservation Ireland, and a few other groups like that to try and see was there any scientific evidence? Because when you punch into Google 5G and bird health, you will have all sorts of different, uh, very alarming stories. Mm. But when you, but it's the same for anything that you punch into Google. And um, there's all sorts of stories one way or the other. But there's no evidence as yet that they do affect, uh, no scientific evidence as yet that they do affect birds. Maybe that will come in time to come, maybe it won't, I don't know. But at the moment, currently, there's certainly, there's none that I was aware of or those, organi those organisations were aware of. Okay. And finally, a texter says we saw two white birds this morning. Uh, would they be doves? About the size of a blackbird, one actually was whiter than the other. Any idea? Um, possibly. Sometimes doves, uh, which have been released and whatnot, that, that will be captive, um, could go, although you think they'd be a little bit bigger than the blackbird. Um, yeah, I wonder... If anybody has any questions like that, what they could do, contact me on either Facebook or Twitter or, uh, or on the email address and they'll see, um, they'll see the email address on naturenorthwest.ie uh, and they have any more details on that and I'll try and dig that out and, and, and figure it out and need a wee bit more info. Okay. Uh, Angus, we didn't even get to the Willow or the Primroses, uh, hopefully next week, but uh, illuminating as always. Uh, thanks. Thanks a million for joining us. Yeah, a 
couple of things that, yeah. that are, are on just worth watching out for if you get a chance. There's a lovely thing called Species of the Day by Biodiversity Ireland. It's on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, mm-hmm. Biodiversity Ireland, Species of the Day. They're putting up some lovely photos of things that you'll see around your own garden. There's also Birdwatch Ireland have a great challenge which is going on to the 11th of April. Um, it's called Stay at Home Challenge and they've printed it. It's Birdwatch Ireland Cork. But if you pop Birdwatch Ireland into Facebook or into Google, um, you'll get their little sheet. And the other thing which is nice that's happening in my own little town here is the Wild Garlic Table on Facebook. They are starting to do some lovely recipes and some of the recipes are from Wild Garlic that you'll find. Not quite yet. It'll be coming out soon. But we'll talk about that again in the future. Brilliant. Thanks, Angus. Thanks, John. Take care. Bye.